Hi, everybody. I am Matthew Miller, and this is a Fedora Council video meeting. We try to conduct our business on email and IRC and chat and things like that most of the time, uh, sometimes in tickets, but it's also good to have these high bandwidth conversations. So we do a video meeting about once a week. We usually check in with some interesting part of the project, uh, see what's going on there, what um, you know needs, what things the Fedora Council can do, and just kind of to distribute the information to people from what's going on from something they might not be following. Uh, so today we have Chris Murphy, who's from the Fedora Workstation Working Group, and he's going to talk about the ButterFS change. So ButterFS or BTRFS or BetterFS, however you want to pronounce it, is the new default file system for desktop um, operating systems in Fedora 33 going forward. Fedora 33 beta is out already. Fedora 33 final in just a scant few weeks. Um, so this is a pretty exciting big change. And I know we've had a lot of enthusiast attention around this, like uh, people who like to run Linux for fun on their systems are very interested in ButterFS. Uh, so uh, it's gotten a lot of attention. So I'm sure there'd be a lot of interesting questions in this. Um, and so uh, Chris doesn't have slides, but he's kind of talk about it. And I guess we'll kind of talk about um, where the idea came from to do this switch, who is behind it, um, how how it's going so far, and uh, what we expect for future plans. I guess that's the the basics. And with that, I'll turn it over to Chris. Thanks, Matthew. Um, so I've been a Fedora user since maybe Fedora 11, um, and active in mostly Fedora QA since around Fedora 16. And now I've been on the workstation working group for a bit over one year. And um, there's a little bit of ButterFS history in Fedora. There's a long arc and a short arc to the story. Um, and the summary that I'll just give away from the outset is that this is a surprise and this is not a surprise. So both of these are, are actually true. Um, the long arc to the story begins in 2011. Um, Fesco actually approved ButterFS as the default file system way back then. And for various reasons, it was set aside and then began a long period of um, ButterFS isn't quite ready. Uh, and things simmered for a number of years. Uh, but quite a lot of work was still going on behind the scenes, ensuring that Fedora continued to adhere to release criteria standards where ButterFS has been um, a release blocking file system for about eight years or so. Um, and then as part of Fedora Next, the workstation working group um, had said that file system decisions were um, up to the working groups and a document that the workstation working group put together way back when um, said that ButterFS would be the default at some point. So uh, yeah. Do you then mind about if I jump three... into some background on that? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, just uh, the Fedora Next thing was a, a strategic initiative we did about five years ago um, to kind of help chart the future path of Fedora. And one of the things we did was say that different um, the, the groups that put together things like Fedora Workstation, KDE, um, Fedora Server are, are you know, top uh, headline additions would have more autonomy in what they do in each thing so that um, we didn't have uh, decisions made for the desktop um, people who are running Fedora on their servers saying, this is a desktop oriented decision. It's terrible for our servers. You can't do it. Um, we wanted to, we wanted, and, and conversely, you know, server oriented decisions um, people on the desktop saying, why are we have all this server stuff affecting what our defaults are? So we wanted to split that up a little bit so we could address these different use cases differently. And so that uh, also has allowed us to experiment with a lot of things. I think it's, I think it's been successful. So um, that's kind of where that, um, yeah, change in decision-making process goes to. Sorry, go on. Yeah, good, agreed uh, with all that. Um, so then about three years ago, the working group, the workstation working group, started looking at changing the default file system. Uh, so that's the long arc of the story that goes back some years. The short arc 
sort of begin. It's in parallel with that. Uh, it's compatible with that story, but it does have a, a different origin point, which is just this year. Um, earlier this year, we took up the question uh, again of default file system to solve a particular problem that is somewhat common for developers um, running out of space on either the root file system uh, or the home file system uh, in the, the current uh, or former, depending on your point of view, um, default uh, partitioning layout and file system setup. Root and home are separate file systems. So sometimes people would run out of space on one or the other while there was still space left over on the other one. Um, so I, I've been trying to get uh, a particular yeah, butter. I, I ran into that a lot myself. <laughs> yeah, some, some it is interesting that some people run into this problem more often than others, um, and it is it is use case specific. Uh, um, so for those people that have that particular use case, they run into it often, and then other people go what? <laughs> but that's sort of a recurring theme in the the default file system conversations is um, folks will say, well, what about, and then they'll give their example and everyone will nod their head and go, yeah, I can see how that could happen. But then lots of other people go, I've never heard of such a thing. So um, a lot of this has been juggling uh, a variety of, of use cases um, and, and trying Sorry, to compromise. Sorry, I threw you off all track there. No, you, not at all. You were talking about the short arc. Um, so uh, the, back to the, sh the, the short arc, um, I've been trying to get a, a particular ButterFS developer on board helping us, uh, Joseph Bosick. Um, Joseph actually used to work at Red Hat um, at the time when Fedora had originally approved uh, ButterFS as the default. Um, and he's been one of the original ButterFS developers for over a decade. Um, but it was Neil Gompa who got multiple parties to commit um, pretty much all at the same time uh, earlier this year. And they put together a presentation for the workstation working group that was, uh, it was compelling. Um, as it turns out, it wasn't any one specific thing that was the most compelling, um, but just the, the sheer number of nice to have features uh, perhaps overwhelmed um, uh, the, the decision-making process uh, and, and made it clear that uh, ButterFS was the way to go. So it really did happen fast um, and it has been a long time coming. So it's both of those uh, story arcs I think are true. Um, and that's pretty much all I have for the for background. Okay. Do you want to talk about some of those features that um, you found compelling, the workstation working group found compelling? And and are we seeing those features now or are they kind of, like are people going to get them with Fedora 33 or are there things that are um, enablers for the future more in those features? I think all of the above. Um, the most immediate issue that is, uh, set aside that is resolved by the change is that uh, users running out of free space on either the root file system or the home file system won't happen anymore. Uh, and that's because we will now have the one big file system approach. So there will be one big ButterFS file system instead of separate file systems for root and home. Um, there will be uh, soft barriers to s continue to separate root and home so that folks that have a particular use case of reusing their um, home directories for uh, reinstallations, you know, if you're reinstalling the operating system, yeah. you want to be able to reuse it. Uh, that is still possible to, to do um, with Anaconda, the installer and ButterFS. The two of them um, for a long time have had really good support uh, for that particular use case to reuse home. Um, okay. Yeah, that was actually- So that would be, be top on the list, I think. Regarding that. Uh, go ahead. Because uh, that's one of the of the, the thing that people worry the most is uh, about how they're going to recover the home in a fresh install if they don't want to 
to lose their data, you know? And the other question is that a lot of people is uh, saying that normal comments like DU or DF uh, works uh, well with uh, BootRFS. So I, if I remember correctly, in a magazine article, there are some kind of uh, comments specifically for BootRFS to, to check the, this usage. So um, how, how do you think people are going to react that they can type a normal DU comment? So, yeah, it's a good question. Um, what I would say for the most part is on the desktop with single devices, uh, we should reliably get um, information from DU and DF. Um, the, there's a possible confusion where DF shows the um, mount points for root and home because they're on separate subvolumes, but they show the same size. Um, that is actually true but it's confusing for those who are used to root file system and the home file system being separate and having separate uh, specific size allocations. Um, so even though that's different uh, with the ButterFS and the layout that we have, um, DF is still telling the truth and so does DU. Um, where we start to run into possibly some difficulties with DU, uh, um, and I'm going to stand way over my skis when I say this, because it's a, a bit of a, a jargon territory that I haven't really sufficiently done any background explanation on. But we have this concept in, in Butterfast snapshots, um, ref link copies or efficient copies, um, and deduplication. And those three things create a, a thing called shared extents. And DU is not aware of shared extents. So in the case where you want to know um, how much space uh, is uniquely um, or exclusively taken up in a particular directory or subvolume, then you do need uh, ButterFS specific DU for that. Um, so it's just a, a matter of perspective. Um, the conventional DU isn't telling uh, uh, a lie, but it isn't telling the entire truth. Um, so there, um, there will be some of that as time goes on. We'll have some of those kinds of confusion, minor confusion, let, I think. Let, let me um, quickly explain those commands for anybody yeah. who um, did, do, doesn't know what they are but hasn't been scared away yet. Um, DF and DU are two uh, command line tools that show you use disk usage on your system. DF is I think of as disk free. It kind of shows you yeah, a list of free. every file system, and it tells you, yeah, how much free space is on each one. And I'm looking on my uh, Fedora 33 beta system right now, and I see that uh, slash the slash file system and the slash home file system, where all my you know uh, user data, my personal files live, um, both show up, but they both show that they're the same size and they have the same amount free. So that could be confusing because it, now it looks like I've got 54 gigabytes free on two two separate file systems, but the fact is, really, that's the same same shared pool, and that's not obvious at all in that tool. So that could definitely confuse people. Um, that's something to be aware of. The other one is disk usage, disk used, and that actually tells you the actual like amount of physical block space that's taken up by a file, as opposed to its nominal size. So a file could, for example, uh, if a file contains a lot of zeros in a row, Linux is smart and um, doesn't actually take up the disk space with all the zeros, it's called a sparse file. So a file might look like it's two terabytes, but only actually be you know, a megabyte or so if it has that sparse feature. So DU will tell you the actual disk space used normally. Um, but maybe not on ButterFS. So I guess the question is, um, is there a reason we don't extend the standard DU command in Fedora or replace the DU command with the ButterFS war aware one? Or uh, what, what is the command I should use for that instead if DU isn't going to be helpful? That's a good question. Um, in my day-to-day -day use of ButterFS for many years now, um, I pretty much only ever use DF and DU. Um, I, I rarely use the ButterFS specific ones unless there's something 
particular that I want to know um, that I'm aware of that is uniquely ButterFS. Um, and those things tend to only come up with regards to snapshots, um, reflink copies, uh, or dedupe. And I'm not doing any dedupe for the most part on any of my systems. So it's just the first two. Uh, yeah, so uh, nevertheless, du just does still tell the truth that, you know, if I point to a directory or a subvolume, it's telling me what's in there. It's just not separating out uh, what is uniquely and only in that particular uh, subvolume. Okay. Yeah. So if you then delete stuff from there, you might be surprised to find that um, you haven't actually freed up space after Correct. all because it's, it's Correct. yeah. And that can yeah. happen with hard links as well, right? That so that's um, yeah, maybe yeah. I, um, okay, so basically, what what I'm hearing from this is if you are aware of storage or using it to do fancy things, um, you will also need to be aware of the tools to understand this, which seems fair. It seems like normal users probably won't get tripped up for this very much. Unless we start doing fancy things, which uses those things in the background without people being aware, which might be some of our future plans, and then we might need to keep that that in um, in mind better. For sure, and that was actually part of a big part of why the options in the feature proposal. There were three options. Um, none of the three are. Uh, um, in Fedora 33 or being used in Fedora 33. So uh, um, one of those compression by default uh, has this sort of a, a effect um, where it, it just adds to the potential confusion of how much space is really being used on disk because um, some of the tools, for example, DF will take compression into account, uh, whereas DU will not take compression into account. Um, huh. Yeah, so uh, folks will will have to do a little bit of experimentation and if they're interested in this sort of thing and, and we'll take the feedback and, and see what sorts of things make sense. And, you know, there's going to be a, another long arc to the story uh, as people actually use it. Um, there are um, so many ways that ButterFS is being used in production that the original designers weren't really expecting. Um, and that's in, in a good sense uh, that, it, that it's um, being found to, to be extremely helpful in ways that, that weren't anticipated. Um, but yeah, I mean, all the file systems are constantly evolving. They're constantly getting improvements, enhancements, and features, and, and ButterFS is no exception. Cool. Um, anyone else have questions? Well, I have another, but I want to give chance to other people <laughs> to ask questions. Go for it, Edward. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, I run four Fedora systems at home, and I'm really interested to know if if recommended to fresh install or is recommended to convert my current home from those systems to BooterFS? Because I, I, I'm aware that is a, there is a conversion tool for ext4 to, to BooterFS, but I'm not sure if it's better to convert it or, fre or back up a fresh install and revert my backup. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, there is a ButterFS convert tool, uh, and it works to convert uh, X4 to ButterFS or RiserFS, um, incidentally, to ButterFS. Um, don't, don't do that. <laughs> no. I, <laughs> uh, I, what I would say about it is the, this is a, an upstream supported tool. Um, the, the, the gotcha is, is that you know, file systems are actually really quite complex and perhaps one of the most non-deterministic things that we have in computer systems today um, the, from the moment you start using them, they start taking multiple uh, quantum uh, forks in uh, probability. Um, you know, how 
they age and uh, how different they are from each other. So uh, the real world testing of the ButterFS Convert tool um, probably doesn't have quite enough for me to highly recommend it. Um, I personally haven't run into failures with it, but I know that some people have run into problems with it. So uh, at least from a Fedora perspective, I would say uh, you should clean install. And that's the expectation is, is that you will clean install. So you'll back up uh, your home directory and uh, completely wipe away uh, the, the previous um, installation um, or at least uh, free up enough space uh, to create a new installation with ButterFS. Yeah. Uh, and maybe uh, at some point, you know, we, we get some bandwidth um, with users, Fedora users community uh, and developers to maybe do a, a ButterFS convert specific test day and get a bunch of real world aged X4 file systems and uh, really hammer on, on making ButterFS convert um, significantly more reliable. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say it's unreliable now, um, but it's sort of a, yeah. I mean, one of the gotchas that you'll have if you're doing a ButterFS convert uh, in Fedora is you won't get the Fedora's uh, installer's layout. You don't get the separate home and root subvolume layout. Uh, you get a, a single subvolume, hidden subvolume with ButterFS convert. So it, it's pretty much exactly like uh, one big X4 file system. There's no um, subvolume layout at all that's created as a part of ButterFS convert. Um, to be clear, my interjection was don't use RiserFS, not to don't use <laughs> a conversion tool. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know it, much about um, it. It's uh, history, we'll say. Um, in, in the meantime, um, yeah, so all my systems, I, I did the reinstall because of that um, dividing, uh, merging the file systems together, home system um, was kind of the key reason I was interested. But people who are upgrading will stay on X4, which to be clear is a perfectly good, fine file system with a lot of history and reliability. So it's not like um, the world's going to end for you if you don't convert. But if you if you like to live on the edge, um, converting seems uh, like an interesting thing to do. Um, and if you don't have a huge amount of data, um, could you do the convert and then create a home subvolume and then move things over? Um, that, that might be uh, w worth writing an article about, um, like how people could do that to get their systems up to date, maybe. Yeah, most things with ButterFS are um, you can be modified after the file system has been created, including subvolumes, and we can use um, reflink copies to efficiently move things over. So you don't have to recopy your data into the new subvolume. So yeah, it is possible to do it. It's, it's a little. Say again. Does that even happen? So if it converts them with separate, basically, as I understand it, the conversion will be, there'll be a separate home volume and a separate uh, root volume that's not a subvolume. Can it ref copy between those two even, or does it have to actually copy? So there's two parts to the question, maybe. If we're doing a conversion of the current layout where root and home are separate file systems, if you do a conversion, they're still separate file systems. Those would be two separate ButterFS file systems. And in that case, there's no such thing as a, as a reflink copy, just okay. like there's no such that, thing as a, as a hard yeah. link. Um, we can like do reflink be copies between subvolumes okay. uh, on the same file system. All right, cool. Uh, sorry, that might be getting in the weeds a little bit, but uh, <laughs> interesting. Um, on, on the next topic, uh, is how are things going with testing? You've talked about test days a little bit here. How how have tests gone so far? Um, do things like have have we come across problems? Have we come across you know how, how widely tested this is? How confident should we be at this point? I'm reasonably confident uh, at this point. Uh, in terms of the numbers, I don't actually have solid numbers. Uh, the the last test day, I believe it was a little bit over 100 testers and over 1,000 tests run. Um, and that was the second test. And it wasn't really a test day, it was a test week. So uh, the numbers are a little high probably because of that. Um, 
other than that, I, I, I don't have really strong numbers. I don't know that we have um, numbers generally in, in Fedora, do we? Uh, numbers are hard, yeah. Numbers are um, hard. Okay. I have not gotten a lot of, um, oh no, this killed my system on the, the uh, uh, yeah, things like anecdotally, yeah, we have had, we've had one of those, um, and it, okay. and, uh, we tracked it through. It actually ended up causing two problems, um, I, for this user, uh, and it turned out that it was, um, bad RAM. So yeah. I would not recommend ButterFS as a memory tester, although it does, <laughs> it does ha seem to have that side effect. Um, I do have some numbers, um, on the ButterFS test day awesome. that I can share in the uh, chat over here. Um, uh, and this is the test on week. The YouTube actually. So, um, can you send that to me separately and then I'll make sure we get it, uh, send it to me and Edward and we'll make sure it gets on the, on the YouTube, um, uh, links as well. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, and I can read them here, uh, briefly. It looks like for the test week that occurred, uh, August 31st, uh, through September, let me see here. From August 31st to September 4th, there were, uh, 28 Red Hat contributors, uh, and 77 non-Red Hat contributors for a total of 1,020, uh, individual tests run. So that's actually, looking at this, probably the best uh, outcome from a test day that we've had in quite a while. Yeah, I, I think a lot of, like I was saying, there's a lot of enthusiast, uh, enthusiasm around this. Um, so it kind of brought out people's interest in helping test out. So that's, that's cool and valuable in itself. Uh, so also I would say that, that in, um, on the QA side, um, there are quite a lot of tests that happen every day. They're automated tests, um, but they, you know, we've been doing automated tests on, um, they use ButterFS as an install target uh, for quite a long time. I mean, since probably day one of open QA, I'm not sure how far back that goes, probably four or five years, maybe longer. Cool. Um, any other questions about the current state of things? Then let's talk about the future. I, uh, I, I have a, oh, a question. Right. Yep. This is already shipped in beta, right? Yes. Yes. Ah. That's the current status. It's shipped in beta. Yes. I exactly. And we have quite a few people running the beta already. People are excited. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so some of the, the future things we're looking at, I guess, are compression, um, maybe some cool backup stuff. Uh, what about encryption? Encryption is a uh, yeah, interesting topic. So right now, uh, ButterFS can, of course, run on um, DMcrypt. Uh, Lux slash DMcrypt, just the, like the same encryption we, we use right now for currently uh, for exactly for with X4. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, I meant to mute my button, but I didn't get to it. And fine. Um, so there is a plan and some work that's going on for. There's work going on for native encryption uh, in ButterFS. And the native encryption uses, um, the kernel has something called FS crypto. And this is part of the work that was done to, to get X4 and F2FS native encryption. And they pulled it out of X4 and F2FS and made an API, a kernel level um, uh, API for this, uh, that X4 still uses in F2FS still uses and ButterFS will use. Um, so we are going to get native encryption uh, at some point. I don't have a time frame for that. I, you know, I, I think that any, anything development wise in any file system is uh, an idea rather than a, a firm plan. And that may also be true uh, more so with ButterFS. Yeah. Um, the idea is, is that these patches should land 
uh, by the end of this year, and uh, it's going to be a, a, a resources um, competition uh, to make sure that the uh, FS Crypto folks uh, evaluate it and and review it and give feedback and you know whenever it gets merged and then it'll need to be in um, upstream production uh, probably before we see it in a mainline kernel. So if I had to guess, um, you know maybe about this time next year, um, we you may know if there may have plans something. for that to be able to be added after the fact, like on an existing system? Yeah, um, yes. Yes, sure. Uh, uh, so the reason why I'm, I'm confident in saying that is because that's already the case with compression and all the other features in, in ButterFS. Um, there are very few things in ButterFS that require uh, uh, a new, creating a new file system. Um, it's possible to uh, just set a feature flag for most of the features that have been added after the fact. Uh, an example of that is uh, Z standard compression. Um, and the pathway, the code path for uh, the native encryption is going to share the same code path as compression. So what I expect is that there will be a feature flag that gets set and that feature flag will simply tell the kernel, um, you know, what the minimum kernel uh, is, is needed to be able to read and or write to the file system. Um, so it may be that there will be old kernels that can read the file system but not write to it if it has encryption enabled uh, because it will be possible to have um, subvolumes that are not encrypted and some subvolumes that are encrypted. Um, so the ones that are not encrypted could be read by an older kernel and then the newer ones, or I'm sorry, the encrypted ones would need a minimum kernel version that supports the native encryption routine. So yeah, set the feature flag, create a new subvolume, and then whatever the commands will end up being to um, set a key uh, and then yeah. encrypt the subvolume. So that's uh, super interesting, both for people who want to change to that later, but also, uh, you know, when I got my new Lenovo ThinkPad with Fedora pre-installed on it, it was awesome to boot it up with Fedora pre-installed. And then because I wanted to have it encrypted, the first thing I did was reinstall. So being able to instead have at that first boot say, do you want to encrypt your system? Check here, give a passphrase. Um, that would be awesome. Yep. And yeah, it's interesting, agreed. actually, also, you're talking about the compression flags. So, yeah, if, you know, uh, there are different algorithms for compression that have different trade-offs and different uh, advantages. So if I decide one, like, I'm not necessarily committed to that forever. If somebody comes up with an awesome new compression thing and gets that into the kernel, I could actually just change, and then new files would be compressed with the new thing, and old files eventually convert it over as they get access and rewritten. That's pretty Correct. cool. Correct, yeah. Uh, the, the compression is at a, um, uh, I, I'm not sure exactly what to call it. I'll just say it's at a block level. There's a, a block size for compression of 128 kilobytes. And uh, a, so a given file um, plausibly will have some blocks that are compressed and some blocks that are not compressed. So ButterFS has the capacity on a per block level to have different, uh, whether compression is on or off or um, uh, what algorithm happens to be used. So all that's baked into the metadata for that file and it doesn't flinch. Yeah. Oh, so you could even have a file that has multiple compression yeah. for different blocks. Yeah. That's yeah. that's disturbing, but all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, can you, this is, Super, super nerdy. Um, can you uh, mark certain files as wanting to have bigger blocks compressed or is it always just the same block size? It's always the same block size. That's not exposed mm -hmm. to the user at the moment. It's 128 kilobytes at the, right now. Uh, there are probably some reasons okay. why that's the case. I'm not sure what they are. Yeah. I have some use cases from an old job where that would have been nice to set, but- uh, They can real, be smaller. Really important to me. Yeah. They can be smaller than 128. So that, larger, that's just, larger is yeah. what I want. Sometimes with big yes, files with much larger blocks, you can get a sure. lot better compression. But yes. that's okay. <laughs> that's probably, again, not important to most people. Um, all right. Um, what, other, what other future plans are there that you want to talk about? What else, what else should we know as the council? Um, 
Yeah, there are. There are just it's like this long list of, of features and what ifs. Uh, one of those um, that we're, we're kind of looking forward to is, is uh, well, we've talked about encryption, we've talked about compression. Um, one that I'm particularly excited about also is, is a, a little bit nerdy, uh, and that is the um, resource isolation that we gain uh, with ButterFS on the IO side. So resource control is a really interesting, um, highly technical, I understand maybe 1% of it, but uh, there's this competition for resources, the resources being memory, CPU, and IO. And uh, using Cgroups v2, we're able to uh, provide um, upper and lower limits. So it's possible to assign a minimum IO, a minimum memory and minimum CPU to, for example, resources that we care about like the desktop itself um, and say that, that those resources, that minimum resource is guaranteed no matter what else is going on on the, on the system. So if you have a, um, a particularly aggressive process, it could be a web browser, it could maybe with a runaway tab and script in it, it could be a compile that you're doing, um, we'll be able to do a better job of of reserving a minimum amount of resources for the desktop to make sure that it stays responsive. Um, and ButterFS is a part of that plan. Um, it's not a required part of it, but it helps make that experience better. So that's something that I'm looking forward to. And that's uh, uh, ongoing. Um, a lot of that work has been happening in Fedora since Fedora 30. Uh, and um, now that we're moving to ButterFS, um, we'll get the IO part of that um, figured out. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So All at right. some point, uh, you know, the, the feature that we, we added in Fedora 32, nothing, nothing ever stays the same in Fedora, it seems, uh, at least not for too long. Uh, a new feature in Fedora 32 was early OOM, um, early OOM, OOM stands for out of memory. So we have a user space out of memory manager very simplistic uh, that will kill off wayward uh, uh, programs that are using too many resources. And um, it's likely that that will uh, be set aside at, in a future, near future, uh, Fedora, uh, because of this resource control work, because we won't need to be killing off programs. We'll just say, hey, you get, you get fewer resources. You're just gonna go really, really slow, but the desktop is gonna be, still be responsive and you'll be able to you know, use And then as a user, you can decide, oh, that's going to Decide really whether slow, or not you right. wanna kill that or not, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, cool. we, there may be some more intelligence. There may be, uh, um, uh, we're looking forward to system D, O, O, M, D. That's a little bit off topic for this, for today but it, it, it loops and feeds back into the resource control, which ButterFS is a part of. So um, there will be another, another round of, of features, as is always the case in Fedora. Cool. cool. Uh, well, thank you very much, Chris. I really appreciated this. You're welcome. I learned some, some details that I hadn't thought about before, so that's cool. Uh, and it's good to have those because uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm around Fedora 33, and the interviewers are all asking me about ButterFS. So I hope other people watch this video uh, and learn things, and I also learned myself so I can uh, help talk better about uh, the work you've done. And thank you for this, and thank you for all the effort you've put into making this happen. You're welcome. Thank you. And thanks to the Fedora community for making it possible. Of course. That's always the case. Bye, everybody. Bye. Time on this. Bye, all.